Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Right, thank you. Okay, let's pray. Father, as we've heard, we're to be a joy-filled people, and we praise you for that. Thank you for the glory of your presence, Lord. Thank you for the glory of your word. We pray you'd help us to concentrate as we listen to the word of God. And Lord, help me to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Right, I, I'd like to turn you to Romans chapter 8 again. So I'm going to read Romans chapter 8 and verses 14 to 18. I've got, I've got the PowerPoint here. I can find it on my screen. Where do I flip through the old uh, <coughs> Sorry, you should have used yours, but you're yours. Yeah. Okay. Five, I can't see them the glasses. Yeah, that's all right. That's right. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, testing, testing, testing. One, two, three, four, five. Is anybody there? Anybody here? No, <laughs> possibly we might be able to have the lights back on, then I can see if there's anybody in this meeting. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm getting very forgetful. Did I pray or not? I did pray, yes. <laughs> right, let's read the scriptures. Um, this is Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 18. Very wonderful and glorious words. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba. Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. <clears throat> Better late than never, isn't it? Um, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So today I, I'm talking on verse 17 to 18. Last time uh, I spoke, we did 16 and 17. I never quite get to the end of a verse. Uh, and we did the witness of the Spirit. I said something about the Moravians, if you remember, the early Methodists, Whitfield, John and Charles, Wesley and so on. All very wonderful stuff. And the fact that as children of God, we are assured of an inheritance. The Holy Spirit in us is the guarantee of that inheritance. And then today, I want to talk about the fact we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, as we just read in verse 17. And I also want to talk about suffering, the place of suffering in the life of the Christian, especially persecution. And so, first of all, heirs of God. The idea of inheritance, inheritance to come, is quite a dominant thought in the New Testament. Let me read one or two things. John 14, 1 to 4. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. Amen. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know the way, and the way you know. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then, but then, face to face. Now we see dimly, but then, face to face. Now I know in part, but then. I shall know as I am also know. Here's another one. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible 
and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, amen, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So we, we, we are people uh, who are looking forward to some, for something to come, something that is good that is coming. We're looking forward. That's not all we are, but we are. That is what we are. We have a, a foretaste now, but we're waiting for the consummation, the fulfillment. A famous preacher, it was actually Martin Lloyd-Jones, I once heard him say something like this. I don't think I wrote down the exact quote, but he said, the Bible doesn't promise us very much in this life and in this world, but in the future. That was his, his viewpoint. And the Bible certainly doesn't teach us that all the problems on this earth in this age will be sorted out. So that, for example, there will be universal peace. Uh, there will be no more wars or violence. There'll be no more hunger or famine or earthquakes or storms, etc., etc. We've been hearing about storms in, in Europe. We, we actually read, for example, in Matthew 24, that all these problems are, are, are going to continue, if, if not get worse and worse. You know the famous chapter, Matthew chapter 24. And I, th I think we mustn't come under the illusion that if only all the, all the countries in, in the world accept proper democracy and become like us, then everything will be okay. Or if everyone accepts the, 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 the particular uh, system we happen to favor, be it democracy or, or capitalism or socialism or whatever, then we will reach a worldwide utopia of peace and prosperity. It's, it's not going to happen. The Bible doesn't speak of that. But it does speak of a glorious inheritance to come for the people of God. And I, I think this idea of an inheritance to come is fundamental to the Christian's outlook. I'm talking about the person who loves Jesus Christ, who has real faith in Jesus Christ, or it should be. It should be fundamental to our outlook. But in contrast, the non-believer has a very bleak future. And I think that this should affect with the way we think of evangelism. The, the fundamental message of the New Testament and of the gospel is, is not that Jesus will improve our life here on earth. If you get saved, if you become a follower of, of Jesus, that might happen, it might not. But in, in fact, from, we know across the world, for many of the disciples of the Lord Jesus, life on this earth actually becomes much worse when they, when they get saved, much more dangerous. The fundamental message of the gospel is that Christ died. For our sins. Amen. Why? Why is that the message? Because I know you know all this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Sorry about that. <laughs> because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. In other words, every person born into this world is on the wrong side of God, on the wrong side of the of the law of God, if I can put it like that. Every, every person is guilty before God. And John the, John the Baptist said it, didn't he? He said about those who don't believe, the wrath of God abides on him. And the Bible says the future of such people is eternal death. The wages of sin is death. Uh, eternal separation from God, from life, from love, from glory. And there, there's only one way out that the Bible teaches, that is faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the propitiation for our sins. He is the wrath bearer for our sins. He bore the wrath of God for us. Amen. I, th I think I've forgotten to, uh, should have had all this organized and I forget to use it. Yes. Yeah. I'm doing fine, am I? Yes, good. Yeah. I'm, I'm, it's this hybrid meetings, Zoom, PowerPoint, technology, <laughs> amplification, which we're not using. <laughs> Amen. 
God sent Jesus forth, this is Romans 3, 25, as a propitiation by his blood. In other words, he had to die, die to put away the wrath of God towards me. Amen. So that the righteousness of God, or from God, through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to all and on all who believe. Praise God that that righteousness is given to all and on all who believe. Amen. In other words, so that a person might move from being in a, a position of being unrighteous before God, and therefore guilty before God, and therefore under judgment and with a terrible future, to a position of being righteous before God, imputed righteousness, what Ron has been talking to us about for some time in a Monday meetings, and therefore eligible to inherit eternal glory. Amen. That is God's intention and plan for every human being. I believe it is. The, the New Testament gospel message is not come to Jesus and he will make you happier. It is. You are not right with God. You are a sinner. You are therefore in great danger. But uh, God loves you enough to have died for you in order to resolve the problem. Come to Jesus to be made right with God. I've been in a slightly in evangelistic mode. I, I had a week of meetings in Uganda, but I wasn't in Uganda. It was obviously over the, the uh, internet. And that was a great blessing, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I, they told me it was a great blessing. I had, I had quite a lot of feedback, actually. So, <clears throat> so if, 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 a, if a person realizes this and acts on it and comes to Christ, of course, it's going to make them happy. I mean, how can I not be happy? I was heading for eternal hell. I was heading for, for, for judgment. Now I'm heading for eternal glory. How can you not be happy? It's only if you don't get things in uh, perspective. God died for me. Amen. For me. For you. <clears throat> because he loves me. Isn't that astonishing? How can I not be happy? Anyway. To carry on, I forgot to, no, I didn't. This is where we're up to. Now the system is working. <laughs> right. So Paul tells us here, 8 verse 17, that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And we are God's own heirs. Isn't that amazing? God's own heirs. And like all good, good fathers, he's going to, Get us ready to take on our airship. You know, Prince Charles is the heir of the Queen. He's been trained for the job. Prince William and Prince Job, uh, not uh, Prince George, are also heirs to, heirs to the throne. They, they are also being ready for the, the, the purpose of their inheritance. It says in Galatians four verse one. He made a com Paul made a comment about the heir. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. The heir is put under guardians, tutors, counselors. The heir is put through experiences, and, and perhaps some of them are difficult experiences, but it's in order to be ready. To we are heirs of God. Amen. He's going to bring into our lives what he knows we need in order to be ready. The inheritance is not dependent on this preparation. You know, Prince, Prince George is the heir to the throne just because of his heredity, he, the virtue of his birth. But we can see that George's father we hope and expect and trust, is getting him ready for that position so that he is able to account himself in a proper way. And our father is far beyond what any earthly father uh, can be. He has all wisdom and knowledge and power, and he's able to give us 
the training that is necessary. We are heirs of God. Amen. That is, that is certain. But God, God, is, God is preparing us for something. It says, we are joint heirs with Christ. And I think this reminds us that we don't have any inheritance uh, in our own right. But <clears throat> it's only because we're joined to the Lord Jesus Christ that we are heirs. It says here, Hebrews chapter 1, verse, verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke, praise God that he speaks, in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us, amen, by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. Jesus is the heir. He is heir of all things, just like he is the seed, you know, in Galatians 4, where we've nearly got up to with Ron. He, he is the heir because he is the only begotten son of God. He, he is unique. He has a unique relationship to the Father. He is eternal God. But for us, we are in him. Amen. And it's on, on this basis and this basis alone that we are heirs of God. Amen. And it's this that makes our, our heirship, our inheritance certain. Because our sin won't exclude us because we're not heirs <coughs> in our own right. Uh, we are joint heirs with Christ and Christ is, is sinless. Our failures won't exclude us uh, because we're not heirs in our own right. We are joint heirs with Christ and, and the Lord Jesus Christ has not failed and he does not fail and he will not fail. I think Paul here, he, he see, he's seeking to give us a confidence. Remember, I think it was it last time or the time before or the time before that, I don't know. Uh, we spoke about sons of God by adoption. It has it in this passage and he, he, he's taking the, the picture of Roman adoption. This is the epistle to the Romans and sonship through adoption for the Romans was permanent. Paul has given us confidence. He's saying, look, God has got hold of your life. He's not going to let you go. And he's, say, he's saying the same thing again. We are joint as with Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ can never stop being God's heir. Amen. I, I now want to get on to the next part of the verse, which is to do with suffering. It says, and if children, then heirs, this is verse 17, Romans 8. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Although I've put there the amplified version. If indeed we share in his suffering, so that we may also share in his glory. So here Paul makes a, a connection between sharing in his glory and, and, and suffering. But I don't believe he's, he's making sharing in his glory dependent on our suffering uh, with him. Uh, in the light of, of what we said, <coughs> um, <coughs> I don't think he's doing that. I think the word if here is in the sense of since or as, like you could read it it's since, since indeed. We share in his suffering or as indeed we are sharing in his suffering. Paul is saying that we Christians do share in his suffering in some measure. That's what he's saying. Whether it's because we are mocked or slandered or humiliated or rejected by anybody, by our families or whoever, maligned, whether we lose our friends, lose our jobs, we're put in prison, tortured. Uh, suffering, suffering is on all sorts of levels and to all sorts of degrees. In this Romans chapter 8, Paul has been going from one glorious thought to another. At least I think he has. And then we've noticed in, in, in the section from verse 14 to 17, he's been teaching about being the sons of God and the glories of being a son of God. And now he suddenly swaps to talk for some time, at least up to verse 25, about to teach about suffering. And it's, it's as if he's saying, 
Yes, there's a wonderful inheritance to come. Yes, we who are followers of Jesus enjoy glorious fellowship with God through the Spirit. But remember the world that we live in. It's full of trouble. It's a fallen world. It's full of trouble and suffering. And we Christians have our, our share in it. And so don't necessarily expect all your temporal problems and challenges to disappear. In fact, you may well have greater challenges. <clears throat> the sufferings of this present time, that's the phrase he uses here in verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall revealed in us. It seems to me that as Christians, we could divide sufferings into two types. There's general suffering, which everybody in this world experiences, including Christians. And then there's, there's, there's suffering which is peculiar to Christians, peculiar to those who follow uh, Jesus. If we, if we think back to Genesis and before the fall, we don't read of any suffering. We read of paradise, amen. The garden of paradise, garden of Eden. Uh, there, was no, there was no death, no animal death, no human death. And then if we, if we look forward into Revelation 21, let me see if I've got this one. Yes. <clears throat> it says that for those who are saved, Suffering will cease. Let me read it. Revelation 21, 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more uh, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the, the former things have passed away. So if we go back far enough, we don't find suffering. If we go forward far enough, we don't find suffering for those who are saved. We do read of suffering for the unsaved. This is why the gospel is urgent. This is why God is on a mission to save people. This is why Jesus came and died for our sins and poured out his blood and suffered in the way he did. This is why God died for us. Amen. But following, following the fall, we, we, we read a lot about suffering. You know, there's pain in childbirth, there's, there's problems and frustrations in agriculture, the ground was cursed, <clears throat> there's hatred, violence, murder, lust, conflicts, there's disease and death. This is, this is the fallen world that we live in. Every, everyone is dying. As soon as we're born into this world, we're en route to our own physical death. That is a fact of life, isn't it? <clears throat> There are famines, there are storms, there are earthquakes, there are floods, sicknesses, pandemics, there's poverty. There are injustices. I hope you're getting all this down. <coughs> Corrupt governments and businesses, evil ideologies, oppression and repression, and so on. Many more things we could, we could say. And the fact is that everyone who lives on this earth is affected by these things either directly or indirectly, including we who are God's children. But of course, in, in the midst of this, we, in, in the middle of it, we thank God uh, for his wonderful and frequent mercies. And there are many mercies that God shows to people in general, but also his own people in, in, in particular. He heals the sick. Amen. Sometimes directly, sometimes through medicine and so on. And we know he intervenes in so many ways. The Bible talks about the goodness of God. We've heard about the goodness of God today. But the, nevertheless, there is this general suffering. Everyone's affected by it. Christians, non-Christians, everybody. But we who follow Jesus can expect suffering which is picked to Christians. We are joint heirs with Christ. He suffered. We can expect to suffer with him. And the, the New Testament is full of this, this truth. 
You know, we live in a, in a war zone. We live in a spiritual war zone. There you have it. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 1 John 5, 19. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The, the, the world hated and hates the Lord Jesus Christ because he's not of this world. This hatred is inspired by, by the devil and his angels. The, the world hates the Lord Jesus Christ, and so he hates his people. We don't live, we don't live in, in, a, in a neutral zone. We, we live in a, in, in a place where potentially we are hated. It's what Jesus said. It's very straightforward. Let me read it for you. John chapter 15, starting verse 18. You look at how many times Jesus were, uh, says the world hates you in this passage. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world will love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. The servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. And if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. <clears throat> but this happened that the world, the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And then John 17, 14, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Our scripture says, eight, Romans 8, 17, that we are to suffer with him. The world hated Jesus, the world will hate us, and we shouldn't be surprised about this because we've been told about it. Jesus told us about it. The world loves its own. Jesus was not of the, this world, so they hated him. We are not of this world. Like Jesus, we have had a birth from above, a new birth. We've been born from somewhere else. We come from somewhere else. So the world hates us also. You think of all the good Jesus did. He, you know, the compassion he showed, the healings he did, the kindness, the people he helped, his graciousness. Uh, but he was hated. <laughs> he was hated. Um, he was hated without a cause. Uh, he was also loved. There were, pe there were people who loved, loved him, of course, but he, he, he was hated. And, and after all, they, they crucified him. I don't think there's any sort of straightforward rationality about this. This is, this is, a, this is a spiritual conflict. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against... <clears throat> Uh, principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. This is, this is not something you can, you can make the, the correct argument for and say, look, look the sort of person Jesus is. How can you hate him? It doesn't work like this. The, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. <clears throat> so we shouldn't be surprised if even in our own culture, anti-Christ attitudes increase more and more, which of course is what is, exactly what is happening. And to me, it seems inevitable that the further away a culture gets from God and from his law and so on, his righteousness, his grace, um, it has an effect on, on the, the society and the more the culture will hate the Lord Jesus Christ and hate his people. And as I say, I don't, I don't think there's, there's an entirely straightforward rationality about it. It's difficult to understand, but we can understand some things. For example, 
Jesus said. But John 3.20, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. And then he said, John 7, 7, the world cannot hate you. He's talking to the Jews, Pharisees and so on. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Light exposes darkness, and that's uncomfortable for those who are loving uh, darkness. Those who are loving darkness can't stand the light. And Jesus said, those who practice evil hate the light. Jesus is the light. He's the light of the world. He said to his disciples, he says to us, you are the light of the world. Those in darkness hate the light. The world hated Jesus because he, John 7, 7 there, testified that its works are evil. And we, we know that we live in a society where increasingly black is called white, white is called black, down is up, up is down, evil is called good, good is called evil, wrong is right, and right is wrong. Not sure if I've missed anything out there. <laughs> but that, that's the society we live in. And so, of course, those who testify to the truth are going to be hated. And even in our society, people lose their jobs, as we've witnessed. So, amen. I'm not, I'm not saying amen to the fact they lose their jobs. I'm saying amen to the truth of the Bible, which encourages our hearts. What, what, what does the New Testament say about this? Let's, let's read this. These, this is John 16, 33. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the, the, the world. In the world you'll have tribulation, uh, peace in him. But be of good cheer, Jesus said. Actually, it's remarkable how many times when it talks about this sort of suffering in the New Testament, it tells us to rejoice. And because he, he doesn't go on to say, don't, don't worry, because you're my people, I'll sort out all this trouble quickly and you'll have a nice, easy time in the world. That's, that's not what he says. And in fact, if you read through the New Testament, that I, I can't find any promise of deliverance in this world. There's a challenge to you, see if you can find any promise of deliverance in this world. Only in the world to come. I think this is the consistent teaching of the New Testament. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. At some level, at some time, somewhere in our lives, we will suffer some sort of persecution. Have we ever been ridiculed for Jesus? Ever been shunned? Ever been mocked? Ever been kicked? I know uh, of a young girl who, <clears throat> one of our local schools, and she wouldn't compromise her position, her Christian position, and she was ostracized just recently by her friends. She told me that a few weeks ago, and I don't know if they've, um, it's improved now, but that's what happened to her. Right, here's another verse, Acts 14. Won't read it all. 21 to 22. When they had preached the gospel to the city and made many disciples. Verse 22. Strength, they were strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the, the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sake. And when his glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. Amen. Notice again that the link here between glory and suffering. It often happens in the New Testament. He says, don't think it's strange. Yes, there's a fiery trial. Don't think it's strange. They hated the Lord Jesus Christ, they will hate you as well. Amen. Here's another one, 1 Peter. Therefore, since Christ suffered, 1 Peter 4 verse 1, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased 
from sin. Arm yourselves with the same mind. Be ready to suffer with Christ. 1 Peter 5 verse 9. Resist him, that is the devil, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in, in the world. You know, we could go through the book of Acts, and this is what we see. Um, in Acts 4, Peter and John were arrested and threatened. They're told not to preach the gospel. In Acts 5, all the apostles were imprisoned and beaten. In Acts 7, Stephen is stoned to death for his faithful witness to the Lord. In Acts 8, the church was scattered because of persecution. This is what it says. Saul was making havoc of the church. And in Acts 9, it said Saul was still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And then on the Damascus road, Jesus spoke to him. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me and this, this is the whole thing isn't it this is the whole the, the whole point god's saints are hated uh, and persecuted because it's the persecution is satanically inspired because the world hates jesus <clears throat> I well they can't be they can't ever be i was going to say i don't think but i don't even think i think i think i believe i know that <laughs> there can never be a peace treaty between the world and Jesus. <clears throat> there can never be reconciliation. So this, this hatred from the world will not stop. I bet you're glad you came to the meeting this morning, aren't you? <laughs> to be cheered up. But this is the Bible truth. <clears throat> and you know, you know that the New Testament is full of this teaching, we could go on and on, but I mustn't go on and on too much. Church history is, is, is full of this as, as well, and, um, and so on. And in a, in even our own British history has a fair amount of it. And uh, I think to a large extent, we believers in the West, we have been, we have, for some time we've been an anomaly. We've been an anomaly. Uh, we're not the North. We are the anomaly. Um, but you know, it wasn't that long ago when faithful followers of Jesus in our own country were tortured and killed here. And of course, we shouldn't assume that it won't happen again. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I'm, 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 I'm looking through my notes here, which I thought I should skip. You know, this is witnessed to throughout history. It's all the Roman persecutions, the, the other persecutions all over Europe, persecutions all around the world. You know, the Moravians, they were persecuted for hundreds of years before that. They had that uh, tremendous revival on August the 13th, was it, or something, or the 17th, 1727. And our own William Tyndale, um, who gave us really much of the English Bible. He was strangled and then burnt at the stake. You know, we could list all the, all the martyrs. You've got Ridley, Latimer, and many we don't know the names of, and so on and so on. And of course, there's huge persecution of Christians today. Open Doors, I read it the other day, uh, saying that over 340 million Christians suffer persecution and discrimination worldwide. And I don't think anything which happens in our cultures even get in, into that, I think. Um, you know, you, you've got North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, we can list them all off. I, I read just yesterday, you know, in, India's prime minister is an extremist Hindu. And this is a quote, he's a Hindu nationalist. And Hindu nationalism tends to view Christianity as a disease that needs to be eradicated at any cost. There are over a billion people living under that regime. It's astonishing, isn't it? And imagine being a Christian, or imagine preaching the gospel to someone and, 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 and they, 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 you're wanting them to become a Christian. What, what, this is why I say, life does not necessarily in, improve. I read yesterday about Pakistan. Anyway, I, I haven't really got time to, to go through it all. Just to finish though, 
Where is there comfort in the midst of, of suffering? If we are suffering, I'm missing out my bits about this and that. <clears throat> Whether our suffering is general suffering or, 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 or this suffering which is peculiar to, to Christians, Paul says that this is to be our attitude. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. In other words, we are, we are to consider, we are to think, we are to meditate on the glory that is to come and realize how great that glory is. The glory that God has promised and, and realize how great it is compared to present uh, suffering. But we're not to give ourselves any false hope. The world will always hate Jesus. We are an anomaly historically and in the present day and according to New Testament Christianity, I believe. If we have relief in this world and we praise God that so often, you all do have relief. Then that's a bonus, you know, not a, not a, a, a certainty. But also, we have to consider this verse, 2 Corinthians 4 to 7, and we should, we, we should meditate on, on the fact that whatever the, the, the suffering, whether of our, our own or our brethren in the world, it's light. This is what Paul says, compared with eternal glory. For our light afflictions, this is 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of, and glory. And we've already read Romans 8, 17 and, and, and so on. And it's got the same idea. You can check it out. Romans 5, 3 to 4. We won't, I won't read it out. <clears throat> but also, if we have trouble, we are able to help others who are also having trouble. This is what Paul said, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us, comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That's, that's a tremendous blessing, isn't it? To be able to, to help other people. So, I've finished nearly. Just to conclude, how should we respond? Um, well, we've really talked about two things here, being heirs, heirs of God. We should thank God that we're his heirs, <clears throat> joint heirs with Christ, and that our inheritance is sure and certain. We should thank God for discipline that he brings into our lives to make us, I can't think of a better word, but... Uh, well, to get us ready for our, our airship. But if we are suffering, we are to consider, we are to reckon, we are to meditate upon, we are to think it through, <clears throat> that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us and, and to us. We are people who are looking forward. We must be prepared to suffer, uh, we shouldn't be surprised if we suffer. And also we, we should remember, as we do, our brothers and sisters in the world who do suffer a tremendous amount, some of them, for, for the Lord uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Amen. Anyway, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words. We thank you for teaching us the truth. And I pray that everyone who's been listening might take something away from this. We do praise you that you've made us your children, Lord. We've been born of your spirit. <clears throat> you have adopted us as your sons. We are joint heirs with Christ. We worship you for these wonderful truths. And Lord, this whole aspect of suffering, we, we pray we might get our lives in perspective, in real perspective. Lord, look forward to glory to come in the right way. Lord, and especially be aware of our, brother, our brethren in the world who suffer so much and stand with them in prayer and, and so on. Lord, we commit one another to you in Jesus' name.
Amen.